1945, the city of Hiroshima was destroyed in about nine seconds by a single atomic bomb. The man responsible was a gentle and eloquent physicist named J. Robert Oppenheimer. This is the story of Robert Oppenheimer and the atomic bomb. Stinson Beach, California, August 7th, 1945. Dear Oppie, you're probably the most famous man in the world today, and yet I am not sure that this letter will reach you. But if it does, I want you to know that we are very proud of you. And if it doesn't, you will know it anyway. We have been irritated by your reticence these past few years, but under the itchy surface, we knew that it was all right, that the work was progressing, that the heart was still there, and the warm being we have known and cherished. I can understand now, as I could guess then, the somber note in you during our last meetings. There is a weight in such a venture which few men in history have had to bear. I know that with your love of men, it is no light thing to have had a part and a great part in a diabolical contrivance for destroying them. But in the possibilities of death are also the possibilities of life. You have made history. We are happy for you. You may well ask why uh, uh, people with a kind heart and hum humanist feelings, why they would uh, go and work on weapons of mass destruction. J. Robert Oppenheimer was born in 1904. The atomic bomb was not yet even science fiction. He was educated at the Ethical Culture School in New York and mastered Harvard's curriculum in three years, summa cum laude. He spoke six languages and seriously considered becoming an architect, a poet, or a scientist. But it was his love of physics that led him to England and Germany in the 1920s, where the atom was beginning to yield its secrets to Einstein, Rutherford, and Bourne. European scientists would later remember him as the quick and eccentric young American who devoured both theoretical physics and 16th century French poetry. One of his best friends was the young American writer, Francis Ferguson. Well, when I first knew him, he knew nothing about politics. He never read the newspaper. Uh, he was extremely ignorant about practical matters, and he didn't care about them. Uh, and uh, his whole life was in the intellect. At the age of 25, he accepted an unusual dual professorship at the University of California at Berkeley and at Caltech in Pasadena. He brought with him the radically new understanding of the atom and the principles of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics was comparatively new then, and it was out, he was opening a new world to them, and he made it tremendous, tremendously exciting and uh, fascinating to them. And in fact, very few of them didn't, take, didn't come back and take it a second year. <laughs> One of his graduate students was Robert Serber. I think there was I remember one Russian lady, Miss Kokcharov, her name was, who had taken it three times. In the fourth year, she wanted to come back, and, and Robert told, refused to allow her into the course. She went on a hunger strike <laughs> and forced her way in. <laughs> Something that might have taken me months to have learned before, he would go over in minutes. And, uh, Robert Wilson, physicist. Very fast clip and uh, very elegant uh, manner. He was extremely quick and very impatient and had a very sharp tongue, which he used on people. He actually terrorized his students when he first began to teach. They were afraid to come into the same room for fear of a nasty remark. 
Robert Oppenheimer and his younger brother Frank were born into a wealthy family and raised in New York City. Throughout the 1930s, they spent their summers with friends at a small ranch leased by the Oppenheimer family, high in the Pecos wilderness of northern New Mexico. Uh, when, when we first went there, uh, we slept on the floor, a board floor, and we didn't have enough covers, and we were pretty frozen by morning. But <laughs> that didn't bother Robert much. He was a fairly hardy fellow, although he didn't look that way. He looked terribly frail, but he was pretty tough. He eventually explored a large part of those mountains, probably knew more about them than almost anybody else. And he would just get on his horse and put a chocolate bar in his pocket and be gone for a day or two at least, sleeping out, probably would see nobody else during the whole trip. Everything my brother did would sort of be special. If he went off in the woods to t take a leak, he'd come back with a flower. And not to disguise the fact that it might leak, but just to make it an occasion, I guess. It was a wonderful time for all of us. All the different guests, most of them physicists, uh, uh, brought some, some ideas and new ideas with them. Uh, also, uh, we, the meals were str sort of strange, sort of peanut butter and Vienna sausages and whiskey. And we'd get sort of drunk when we were high up, and we'd all act kind of silly, I guess. <laughs> I've never been on a horse in my life. <laughs> he, he, so, so, they gave us maps, and they sent us off on this uh, three-day <laughs> trip you know, over the mountain. Mountain passes are 12,500 feet. He went out with an absolute minimum of, uh, of equipment. You know, a bottle of whiskey and some graham crackers <laughs> and food and oats for the horses. It was the rainy season. Finally, it, we noticed it didn't rain quite as much at night. So we started to ride at night. And I don't know uh, what we gained from riding at night because it also rained at night. Imagine this, you're... you're they were riding on a mountain ridge at midnight in the middle of a thunderstorm with lightning hitting all around you. You come to a fork in the road in the trail, and Robert says, this, this way it's only seven miles home. This way it's a little longer, but it's much more beautiful. <laughs> But far from the Pecos wilderness, far from Berkeley, was Adolf Hitler. And Robert Oppenheimer was a Jew with friends and relatives in Germany. He did not keep up with current events. He read novels or he read philosophy books or serious books. But uh, all of a sudden, and I think it was due in large part to uh, Hitler and to the Nazi persecution of the, due, of the Jews, that he suddenly... Uh, I think it must have been fairly suddenly, he suddenly realized that things were getting out of hand and that something had to be done about it by serious people. So he began reading. Hokan Chevalier was a professor of French literature at Berkeley, active in left-wing causes. He and Oppenheimer grew to be close friends. On one of his many trips to the east on the train, he had taken the three volumes of Das Kapital and he had read them all in the original on his way to New York. In, Ger in German? In German, yes. And uh, then shortly after, apparently, he bought the complete works of Lenin and read those. He was a tremendous intellect. I don't believe I have known another person who was quite so quick in comprehending. Hans Bethe, Nobel laureate. Uh, in comprehending both scientific and general knowledge. At uh, Berkeley, he'd read the Bhagavad Gita and learned Sanskrit, and was really taken by the, by the charm and the kind of general wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita. I, I, some people seem to think he was, uh, got very religiously involved in it, but that's not a true, true at all. Eh? The late 1930s, while America endured a Great Depression, fascism seethed in Germany. A civil war raged in Spain, 
and Oppenheimer moved further to the left. Kitty Harrison was a communist and had lost her first husband in the Spanish Civil War. In 1940, she and Robert Oppenheimer were married. Shortly before then, Robert's brother Frank and his wife Jackie had joined the Communist Party in California. Robert, not a joiner, stayed aloof from formal association, but his left-wing activities did attract official attention. As war clouds gathered in Europe, the FBI added Oppenheimer's name to a list of people to be imprisoned in the event of national emergency. Back in 1938, uh, Hahn and Strassmann in Germany discovered fission. And many people realized very quickly that it might be possible to make atomic bombs, to use fission uh, as an explosive, to use uranium as an explosive. I first heard about, about I think Niels Bohr told me, I think it was in Princeton. And when I came back to Columbia and I told Enrico Fermi about it, by uh, the end of the day, he had calculated the, uh, uh, the depth of a crater, the size of a crater, which one pound would, uh, would give exploding. The first I heard about fission was uh, a letter from Oppenheimer. And the news had just gotten to Berkeley, and he, he, he wrote to me. I gave a seminar on it that same day, and, uh, at uh, Urbana, I mean, I mean one, it was one of these ideas, you know, uh, when somebody told you, you say, how could I be so stupid not to have seen that before? <laughs> and I think even in the first letter, he mentioned the possibility of making bomb. I suppose that Freeman Dyson, physicist, he was at that time profoundly impressed with the precariousness of the Allied situation, that after all, most of his friends were Europeans, many of them in countries which had been occupied by the Germans. The Germans looked as though they were the wave of the future at that time. He said this, the danger that this may mean the end of Western civilization. My brother viewed it as not just something persecuting uh, our own uh, relatives, but as a kind of thing that could be a wave that would walk over the United States as well. He wanted to help. He thought probably the best way to do this, where he had most competence, would be in uh, the atomic bomb work. And therefore, it was natural for him, almost necessary for him, that this is where he would put his effort. He built the atomic bomb, or he didn't build it, but he led the effort to build the atomic bomb because he thought this was necessary to save Western civilization. It was feared that Nazi scientists were already building an atomic bomb in 1939 when Albert Einstein informed President Roosevelt that such a thing was even possible. The program Roosevelt initiated was small and had little momentum until December 7, 1941. The day after Pearl Harbor, America declared war on Japan and Germany. We had on the one side this crazy nation and this demon in Germany. I, I, Rabi. And uh, these funny people who didn't know what the Western world was about to tackle the United States. I mean, there was no question in my mind that this something had to be done, and furthermore, we weren't winning at all. I was caught up in the war effort and, and with a patriotic fever that it's hard to imagine nowadays. It's been so long since uh, anything of that kind has motivated uh, America, seems to have motivated Americans, 
and one would have done anything that was necessary to get on with the war. The bomb project had a sudden urgency. The U.S. Army was given charge and codenamed it the Manhattan District, with General Leslie Groves in command, and secret laboratories scattered across the country. Groves put Oppenheimer in charge of a group at Berkeley to explore the basic scientific requirements of an atomic bomb. Oppenheimer, who had taken to wearing a rakish pork pie hat, took pleasure in his new official title, Coordinator of Rapid Rupture. That was the time when the, the big change in his life occurred. And it must have been during that time that the dream somehow got hold of him of really producing a nuclear weapon, which other people had been talking about, that he was the fellow who really did it. It is a very different uh, attitude if you want to find out the deep secrets of nature, which is what he had wanted to do before. And on the other hand, if you want to to produce something, to produce a mechanism that works. It was a different problem, different attitude, and he completely changed to fit the new role. The Los Alamos Boys School, high on a mesa 50 miles north of Santa Fe, New Mexico, not far from the Oppenheimer Ranch. In the summer of 1942, students began to notice low-flying military aircraft overhead. One student was Sterling Colgate. It was in the fall of 42 when uh, this place was invaded by uh, uh, an, an armada of uh, bulldozers and construction crew. Uh, it suddenly we uh, knew that the war had arrived here and these two uh, characters showed up, uh, Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones. Uh, one wearing a pork pie hat and the other a, a suit and a normal hat. And these two guys went around as if, uh, uh, well, one, they owned the place, which evidently they did, but more than that, as if their pseudonyms was the normal sort of thing to do. My God, I mean, there their pictures were in our, in our physics book, and we all had physics. One is the lead theoretical physicist of his age, and the other, uh, uh, head of a major laboratory who had done the cyclotron and things like that. So we immediately knew that one, uh, uh, they felt that it was so important to be Oppenheimer and Lawrence that they had to have a pseudonym. Uh, two, that they were putting megabucks, uh, multi-megabucks, into what seemed to us the worst place in the world to have a laboratory. Granting Oppenheimer's request for a single isolated lab where the bomb could be designed and built, General Groves appropriated the remote school and officially named Oppenheimer scientific director. Oppenheimer's first job was to convince scientists and their families to join him for the duration of the war in a place he was not allowed to identify, to work on a project he was not always allowed to describe. Well, I was a young assistant professor the University of Wisconsin. Stan Mac Ulam, mathematician, and his wife, and, uh, Francoise. The war was on. I noticed that some other younger colleagues, especially, were disappearing from town. They couldn't tell where they were going. It was very secret. But when I learned that I'm supposed to go somewhere to New Mexico, uh, Francoise uh, wanted to know about the state of New Mexico. So I went to the library and borrowed one of these WPA books on various states, and there was one volume on New Mexico. And then, looking at it, I noticed at the back of the book there was a list of previous borrowers. To my amazement, several names of people who just disappeared a week or two before were put down there as borrowers. Place called Robert Lane. Porton was a private in the Army. And I don't know how many people uh, viewing this program ever had the pleasure of getting off a train at Lamy, New Mexico, but uh, we looked at it as if it were out of Siberia. It was very strange. There was nothing but uh, a lot of sand, sagebrush, and but there was a GI vehicle, and, a, and we 
got in, still wondering where we were and why we were there. Scientific and military personnel arrive from all over America, many traveling under assumed names. A station master in Princeton, New Jersey, was baffled at the sudden demand for one-way tickets to the tiny station outside Santa Fe. It was a little bit awe-inspiring to be in the middle of nowhere like this and not knowing what we were getting into, uh, not the slightest idea. Next stop for newly arrived personnel was an inconspicuous building in Santa Fe. Dorothy McKibben was in charge of the tiny office. Santa Fe was full of young FBI agents, middle-aged agents. And to some of us, they were quite discernible because they were so well-dressed. What did they do? They uh, wore gray slacks and tweed jackets and shirt with necktie, and they leaned against the walls of buildings, and they hung around La Fonda and the Capitol Pharmacy and all restaurants. We drove through Santa Fe and then a place called Española and then hit some dips in the road and then started to climb. And I had never been in mountainous country. It was very interesting. I had just finished reading The Mount Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann. And of course, uh, to go to this mysterious mountain on the top of which there would be a secret laboratory uh, in which we would go into, the doors would slam, and uh, a few years later, why we would come out bearing an atomic bomb. Very impressive, strange scenery, mountains, rocks, the desert. We crossed Rio Grande and arrived in a place full of little, well, how to call it, almost huts. Oppenheimer had brought scientists and their families fresh from distinguished campuses all over the country. Ivied halls, soaring campaniles, vaulted chapels. Los Alamos was a boom town. Hastily constructed wooden buildings, dirt streets, coal stoves, and only five bathtubs. There were no sidewalks. The streets were all dirt. The water situation was always bad. One young physicist was Robert Crone. It was not at all unusual to open your faucet and have worms come out. Everybody was wearing Western clothes, jeans, boots, parkas. There was a feeling of mountain resort in addition to army camp. And the mixture was unbelievable. And then there was the awful mud. The physicist Edward Teller had brought a piano and played Beethoven late into the night. From his cramped quarters in a four-family dwelling, he could disturb more Nobel laureates at once than he could have anywhere else in the world. Oppenheimer had gathered the elite in physics, mathematics, and chemistry to build the atomic bomb. I don't believe there was ever before an assembly of so many first-rate people for one task. They, in turn, recruited their best students, promising kids working side by side with Nobel laureates. There was no class distinction between the small fry and the big shots. When I first came to the, the, to the United States, I got to know a lot of the young people who had been at Los Alamos. Most of them were very young. They'd just gone right into it without even finishing their scientific training. And for them, it was just the most marvelous time of their lives. People worked hard, scientists worked around the clock, and the people made up for the lack of big city life, and it was a lot of partying. We were very young, and it was just like a camp out. Liquor was short in the area, so in order to spice up the parties, we used lab alcohol. Lab alcohol is 200 proof, basically. which is just exactly what you're looking for, for punch. If you were in a large hall and you saw several groups of people, the largest groups would be hovering around Oppenheimer. He was great at a party, and women simply loved him and still do. I found it extremely dashing in a sort of uh, 
elegant way. It was, for these young people, not only a great experience, it was also fun. It was, it was a laugh. Yes, it was a good time. It was a good time in America. It was a good time to be American. It was a, a time when the whole country was pulling together uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a cause which even now I think was just. That is the idea that the Nazis would, uh, uh, Nazi Germany would win that war could have uh, led to, uh, I, it seemed to me, a thousand years of dark ages and everything that we meant by civilization could have come to an end. That's what it seemed to me was what the fight was about, or something pretty close to that. And most Americans felt that, and most Americans were in it just as, uh, as uh, hard as they could be. Their average age was 29, and their job was to construct a mechanism which would trigger in a millionth of a second a violent chain reaction. They had two dance bands, a soda fountain, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, a radio station with no call letters, a cyclotron, and 7,000 fire extinguishers. Somehow Oppenheimer put this thing together. He was the conductor of the orchestra or whatever it was. Somehow he created this fantastic esprit. No matter who you talk to, they all lived it, and, and they all, I think, almost without exception, felt it most strongly that without him this wouldn't have happened, it couldn't have happened. Oppenheimer had envisioned a small community of 30 scientists and their families, but by 1944 he was in charge of a walled city of 6,000. The cost escalated to $56 million. Seven divisions, theoretical physics, experimental physics, ordnance, explosives, bomb physics, chemistry and metallurgy. He knew and understood everything that went on in the laboratory, whether it was chemistry or theoretical physics or machine shop. He could keep it all in his head and coordinate it. It was clear, also at Los Alamos, that he was intellectually superior to us. The most striking contradiction is the fact that this man, who was so unworldly, so unpolitical in his youth, such a great scholar, so fond of metaphysical poetry, should suddenly emerge as the great administrator who put Los Alamos together and produced the atomic bomb. I saw him change from that uh, almost irresponsible intellectual bohemian... And person, radical. Radical person that he was that I, and that I had known at, at Berkeley. Uh, to someone who was just completely dedicated to getting on with the war. I think it was a real stroke of genius on part of General Groves, who was not generally considered to be a genius, uh, to have appointed him. It was a most improbable appointment. I was astonished. The professor and the general made an unlikely team. When Groves took charge of the Manhattan Project in 1942, there was barely enough plutonium in the world to cover the head of a pin, and very little uranium-235. These were the only elements that could fuel the Los Alamos bomb. To produce U-235, Groves built a secret 44-acre building in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. In Hanford, Washington, giant reactors labored to produce a few pounds of plutonium. It was the most expensive scientific project in the history of the world. General Groves distrusted liberals, and yet in spite of Oppenheimer's well-documented leftist background, Groves overruled the astonished security officers who tried to block Oppenheimer's clearance. He had arguments with Gen General Groves, but I think they were mostly about sort of trivial things, like that the fact that people were having too many babies, and uh, he couldn't do anything about that. And uh, when things came up, um, they were really important. I think General Crowe's usually supported him. He had to support Robert himself against the uh, intelligence people who, of course, well, in fact, they not only wouldn't have cleared Robert, they obviously wouldn't have cleared three quarters of the people on the, uh, at, at the place. So, Why not? Hmm? Well, they, I mean, they were all moderately liberal, <laughs> moderately left-wing people.
It was a new and strange world. Barbed wire, bodyguards, censored letters, secrets from their wives and children. Well, I'd written, try to be so newsy when I was in Fort Leonard Wood, and when I came here, I would write and say, I'm out here in the West, and the scenery is beautiful, and the weather is just gorgeous. And my mother would write back and say, well, where are you really, and what are you doing? And I would write back and say, I'm out here in the West, and the weather is gorgeous, and the scenery is beautiful. And she never understood that until the war was over, and I could explain it to her. And you heard throughout the town that they were joking and saying it's a submarine base to make windshield wipers for submarines, or it was a Navy installation, or, or something like that. And they thought it was a great joke. G2 wanted a rumor spread and fed with her, and all kinds of speculation about what was going on at Los Alamos. They wanted to get out a rumor that we were busy making electric rockets. And, and we, we tried it. We went down, and uh, we tried to La Fonda Bar, which is usually crowded. Of course, that night it was now half deserted. <laughs> And we talked as loudly as we could about electric rockets, but nobody seemed to pay any attention. <laughs> so then we d went out to a workman's bar, <laughs> much rougher, and uh, Charlotte danced, and some, some uh, Spanish-American came along and asked her to dance. She was trying to tell him about Los Alamos, and he was trying to tell her that he, what he wanted was a ranch to raise horses. <laughs> he couldn't have been less interested. <laughs> And finally, I grabbed the guy at the bar, and I took him by his lapels and shook him and said, you know what we're doing in Los Alamos. And he was so drunk, I'm sure he didn't remember a word of it. It was a complete flop. It's not as easy as it sounds to be a spy. <laughs> <laughs> 